Hello. I just wanted to welcome all of you. Um, this was supposed to just be a kind of cozy event in the library, and somehow it, it morphed into something much bigger. But we want to welcome all of you here, and I also am going to introduce to you our wonderful presenter, um, Cody Sanders. We are very glad to have him here. He was a pastor at the American Baptist Church in Harvard Square. But while he was a pastor, he also published quite a bit. And you're going to get to hear about one of his books, um, dealing especially with LGBTQ community and um, suicide. We love to have him here. Students love him. And he's a wonderful citizen within the community. So we welcome Cody, and we welcome all of you. Thanks, Lois, and thank you all for being here. It's really special to share this time with you and to share some stories with you. Uh, my work has been really narrative-focused work, so I'll tell a lot of stories today, some from my participants and the research that I've done around LGBTQ suicide, some from stories of the larger LGBTQ kind of Christian communities through time. And I do want to warn you that stories can be really dangerous to hear. Stories come to live inside of you in ways that you don't anticipate. I don't think there's a week that has gone by when I haven't thought about the stories that I heard from my research participants. They have lived in me and shaped me and changed me in ways that I'm very appreciative of. Um, but, you know, stories can also be disturbing and dangerous. They can require something of you invite something of you, provoke something in you, because we're shaped by stories. And when stories from other people's libraries come to be inside our inner libraries, they uh, shape us. When stories from the collective library come into our inner library, sometimes unbidden, they can cause some damage, and we're going to talk some about that today. But I also want to say that disavowing stories or refusing to listen to stories is also a method of uh, violence and control. So I think letting stories flourish, to be told and to invite others into courageous listening is an act of compassion, and a pastoral act, but it's also an act of justice and repair. So I invite you to hear these stories in that light today. This is sort of my guiding ethic for how I think about working with stories. I want to help LGBTQ people uh, to share their stories of stress and trauma in a liberative way, because for most of time, LGBTQ people have had our stories narrated for us in language that we did not choose, oftentimes through the powerful producers of discourse in our society, the legal discourse, the medical psychiatric discourse, and the ecclesial theological discourse. So I want to return to uh, a very experienced near description of stress and trauma lived in the lives of LGBTQ people. And uh, this won't mean a lot to everybody in the room, but it will mean something to some people in the room. I am going beyond sort of a biomedical model of trauma as I uh, hear these stories and make sense of them. I also want to help communities like churches and seminaries and places that invite me in to talk about these things, to decrease the stress trauma potential for LGBTQIA people in those communities, uh, and to increase flourishing for queer and trans people, which I believe also means increasing, increasing the flourishing for the entire community. Thanks. I do want to say this. Uh, I, when I wrote this book, I did this research uh, over the course of uh, time before this book came out. But Christianity, LGBTQ, Suicide, and the Souls of Queer Folk came out in 2021. At that time, there were no articles in the theological journals on LGBTQ suicide. The only articles that were really available were from social scientists, and they were really good articles in a lot of ways, but they didn't treat religion and spirituality and theology with any real depth or nuance. But since I did this research and published it, there have been a couple of other really good books that I just want to name here. Religious Trauma by Brooke Peterson, who is one of our Lutheran colleagues at uh, the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. 
she's really dealing with the ways that LGBTQ people return to churches and communities of faith after experiencing some range of stress and trauma. And then Joel Hollier, who's uh, uh, in Australia, who writes really well about evangelical experiences of LGBTQ people. And then a good friend of mine, Keith Menhenek, who wrote this PhD dissertation a couple of years ago at Emory, uh, To Be Loved While We're Living. Uh, these uh, books and this dissertation, which will soon become a book, are really important additions to this research that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I'm trying to sort of reshape some of my own research in light of what they've found from their uh, qualitative research as well. You're going to hear these continua throughout the talk. I'm not going to narrate each time I'm moving along these continua, but I just want you to be aware of them, to hear how stress and trauma, which is its own continuum, uh, works on individual levels, works on institutional levels, works on a socio-political level, and in religious and theological dimensions as well. I just want to name this. It's not a part of the talk that I'm going to deal with very much, but it's really important right now. What is this? February 7th, 2024. So far this year, 398 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in legislatures across the country. This is a really critical time to pay attention to the socio-political level and the ways that it affects individual lives. The kind of stress and chronic stress and distress that uh, is perpetuated through the socio-political level of LGBTQ violence really weighs heavily on LGBTQ people and communities. We're going to work along the stress trauma continuum, which I'll talk about again in a minute, and also along this biopsychosocial and spiritual continuum. Stress and trauma doesn't just work on our bodies or on our psyches, but it works in the entirety of our beingness, and in my perspective, our beingness in relation to others. So when I talk about the stress trauma continuum, I'm still working out what this continuum might look like for LGBTQ people. And I've been in conversation with my uh, colleague Keith Menhenek about this a good bit. We just wrote an article in Pastoral Psychology about this. But I'm thinking about things from stress, like the kind of microaggressions that we hear in our everyday lives and that we all perpetuate uh, based on race, gender, class, sexuality, etc. That, to my mind, is sort of the stress part of this continuum. Um, the chronic stress part of this continuum would be something like the, the continuation of dealing with those microaggressive experiences everywhere we go. Then moving along to this sort of psychosocial spiritual distress uh, and then into violence, which takes place on several different levels that we'll talk about. And then the ways that trauma can also come into the picture. Uh, and I want to say, you know, this sort of um, statement that's become a really helpful mantra that all trauma is stressful, but not all stress is trauma. Trauma is what happens to us, in us, uh, in our biopsychosocial being uh, in relation to a traumatic event, but not all stress is trauma. I say that because I think we've come to use the term trauma to hold a lot more conceptual weight than it can really hold. And I want to work on expanding this continuum so that we can talk about our stressful events, our chronic stress that we carry with us in our bodies, our distress, the violence, because oftentimes when we talk about trauma, it can occlude the fact that there are perpetuators of the events that are traumatic. And I want to name that violence as it occurs. And one area of this continuum that I want to talk about a bit today that's not in the book, if you've read the book, I'm sure most of you have, right? Um, I know Isaac has at least. Um, this, part is not, <laughs> this part is not in the book, but it's some ideas I'm trying out uh, as I talk about this uh, more and more, because I think this is a really important part of it. And it's the sense of being out of time. And this is a double entendre. We'll talk about both meanings of this. Um, the first one, uh, though, deals with the way that, well, for, for example, like I work with narratives. Narratives are the methodological uh, uh, piece of this research. And when you deal with narratives, you're dealing with temporality. But I don't know a lot of work that has taken into consideration the way that temporality and chronology become a part of the stress trauma uh, 
experience for LGBTQ people. And I don't necessarily mean a linear chronology either. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But the sense of being out of time has at least two um, valences to it. One is this notion of chronostress, which to my knowledge has not been written about anywhere. When you Google it, you get a couple of articles on the stress of jet lag. But that's not what I mean here. Uh, chronostress is when insufficient narrative material from pasts, from histories, from ancestors uh, is not available to us to construct our sense of LGBTQ self and community and or our sense of relationship to ultimacy or to God. This kind of chrono stress is when we are out of time, as in our individual narrative can't fit within another larger narrative arc. I'll show you how that works in some ways. But in addition to showing you how this works violently against LGBTQ people, I also want to use this talk as a way of correcting and treating the chrono stress that we experience when we feel that we are out of a part any particular timeline, that we don't belong to a particular history or to a particular people, and that we don't know who our ancestors are. So I want to tell you some stories of ancestors. And queer people have to choose our ancestors, discover our ancestors. We don't have biological ones, but we do have ancestors that belong to us and that we belong to. Some of you have heard this story in chapel four or five months ago, but I'm going to tell it again because it's not one I hear told many places. In most places I tell it, nobody knows the story, and I think it's an important one for us. It happened when the, uh, the first time that LGBTQ people um, founded a church for LGBTQ people to belong. And it happened like this. There was a group of gay and lesbian parishioners at a Catholic parish who had confided in their priest, told their priest about their uh, same gender loving uh, status and wanted some conversation with their priest about what that meant for their faith. And this was the priest's pastoral response. Each week when the gay and lesbian parishioners of that parish would approach the altar rail for the elements of communion, when the priest would get to one of them, he would skip them over and serve the next person. And it happened week after week after week, denied communion uh, at their very own church because of something the priest knew about them. Some others in the congregation, in addition to the gay and lesbian people, were very upset by this, understandably. So what they did was they went down the street, they rented space in a hotel lounge, they pulled together a couple of cocktail tables into a makeshift altar, and they began what became the Eucharistic Catholic Church. The first time LGBTQ people had ever formed a church for their own belongingness and survival and nurturance at the table of grace. I always like to ask people where they think this happened and when they think this happened. Uh, most people guess somewhere like in New York or San Francisco or LA, sometime around like the late 60s, early 70s, when the modern gay rights movement was sort of energized or maybe later in the AIDS epidemic. Eucharistic Catholic Church was founded in 1946 in Atlanta, Georgia. Not only 1946 in Atlanta, Georgia, which is remarkable on its own, it was founded as a church where gay and lesbian people could belong, but straight people could belong too, where Catholics and Protestants and people who didn't consider themselves Christians but wanted a community to belong could belong. And in 1946, Atlanta, it was founded as a racially integrated congregation. And everywhere I go and tell the story, no one knows it. How many of you, aside from hearing it in chapel a few months ago, had ever heard this story anywhere else? One person. I heard the story from Heather Rachel White, who's a queer historian of religious movements in the US, and she has some really great materials that I've linked in the bibliography, which you'll get a little later. But I tell this story because this story, uh, for you queer and trans people, this is a story of your ancestors. These are the people in our narrative arc of Christian history that you belong to. And for all of you who are part of Christian churches, 
This is a story that belongs to the church. No matter how much we disavow it and distance ourselves from it, although really it's been more benign than that, we've just forgotten it because no one's told this story. No one's kept it circulating in our, uh, in our narrative collection. And so I'm grateful for people like Heather Rachel White and other historians uh, to, who do this work to keep these stories circulating. And I invite you to tell these stories when you tell stories of queer people because our lives are not totalized by experiences of trauma or rejection or stress or suicide. Our stories are complex and beautiful and if the church in this era needs a story about tenacity and faithfulness and creativity, here's the story. We need this kind of story in our Christian communities. Violence works on several different levels that you'll see throughout this talk. Um, physical violence, of course. This is the violence against the body, the violence that occurs through school bullying. Uh, you can look at the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network's report that they do every couple of years and look at the uh, status of school experiences for LGBTQ people right now. Uh, and it's a really hard picture to look at statistically. Um, this is also the, the kind of violence that we think about when we think of hate crime violence and hate crime murders. Uh, we go to Trans Day of Remembrance every year and say the names of the several hundred trans people around the world who have been killed by hate crime violence. This is also, I think, the kind of violence that uh, family rejection uh, fits into because it places youth in precarious posi positions of homelessness and precarity. But I wanna look more at these other two forms of violence. Epistemological violence targets our ways of knowing self in relation through narrative across time. Epistemological violence happens when we are denied our stories, when we don't have the kind of narrative material to construct our sense of self in relation to others and self in relation to God, because the stories have been kept from us, the stories have been denied validity, uh, the stories are not available for us to construct our sense of self. But then there's this other category, which is really more uh, what I was looking at in the original research on suicide, which is ontological violence. And this, to my mind, targets our sense of self or our aura of deep myth that iterates how we are connected to one another and to the divine. Uh, it attacks the heart of our humanness, the core sense of our beingness, or in the book, I use the language of soul to describe this level at which violence works against us. You'll see these three levels come up several times in the narrative material. And I wanna introduce you to one person who you're gonna hear from a couple of times. I'm not gonna share material from all of my research participants because there's not quite time for that. I wanna introduce you to two people today though, two people whose stories live in my heart and mind all the time, decade or more after I heard these stories. One is Thomas. Thomas had a suicide attempt in his 20s. He spent the next 30 or so years outside of any Christian community because he didn't know that there were any he could belong to. I met him about 30 years after his suicide attempt when he was around 50. We were also meeting, by the way, in a city where I, I could point to six or so affirming churches within four or five miles of where we sat, and he didn't know any of them existed because we do all this really good, beautiful, hard work to become affirming communities of faith, and then we don't tell anybody about it. And people can't find us because we don't tell that story. And that was the case for Thomas. And this uh, story of his, this piece of his story, uh, illustrates one narrative theme from the research in the book, and I'm only gonna talk about two or three of the narrative themes, but this notion of constitutive co condemnation, I think, is a really helpful illustration of ontological violence. Thomas, Thomas says, as a kid, if you're told you do something and it's an abomination, you can't tell the difference between being told what you do is an abomination and who you are is an abomination. I think it's impossible for a kid, and the primary message about that was so concerned with whether or not you had sinned that the fact that Jesus loved me, no matter what, now and forever, was lost. So I stayed alone for more than a decade. 
Later he said, all they had to do was imply it. All they had to do was not talk about being gay as if it was real. It's tone, the tone of what you say. And it's like a bell that goes off. The first time you hear a bell, you know what a bell sounds like. The first time you hear that you're an abomination, you remember that tone. And they don't have to say it ever again in those words. This would move along the continuum to like spiritual distress or maybe even trauma. You can see how like just the Pavlovian response to a tone brought up in Thomas's body what he had heard as a child, that he was an abomination. Uh, this is the way in which theological narratives come to construct our sense of self at a level of perceived coreness, at least. Something that we talk about like our, uh, the core of our humanity or our soul, which becomes sedimented over time by repeated exposure to these condemnatory narratives. And these narratives, of course, for my participants who grew up in churches, all drew on narratives of ultimacy, that it was God who sees you like this. So that relationship to the divine was a part of this ontological violence where Thomas started to conceive himself at a constitutive level as condemned. Thomas also has this really um, beautiful illustration of, a, of a, uh, an idea that came out in the research in the book. And it's probably the idea that, has, that seems to have been most meaningful to other researchers from my work, which is theological doublespeak. Uh, this is the way that condemnatory theological messages and life-giving theological messages were completely bound up with one another. Listen to the way Thomas says it. The message of Christ is love and the message of Christ is damnation. And they use the same words. It was maddening. And a mind can't do that. A mind cannot fix that, ever. It's impossible. It's insane. You're paralyzed between those two things. God hates me, and God loves me. Now, the distress from this, for many of my participants, came in trying to work through that maddening pain of these conflicting narratives that were chaotic for them, that were intensely distressing for them, and that they often had to do in solitude. For 30 years, Thomas had no companion, no pastor, no therapist, no friend who helped him work through the conflicting Christian narratives uh, that had condemned him at a constitutive level. And for you who work in therapeutic uh, uh, work or chaplaincy or pastors, this is one of the things that the um, social science and therapeutic literature really missed uh, early on when I was looking at this in the social science literature. It's not as easy as just simply going from an affirming or a non-affirming church to an affirming church and thinking that that sort of settles it all for someone. Because these narratives of condemnation and life-giving love were so bound up with one another that the disentanglement of those things became the really critical pastoral and or therapeutic work that needed to be done. There were things about their religious traditions, even if they had to leave them, that they wanted to hang on to because they were the narratives, the material, the relationships that constituted something important about their sense of self or soul, their relationship to God. And there were things about those, uh, those uh, communities and theological uh, frameworks that they needed to let go of. But disentangling those things to help them hang on to the life-giving and let go of the death-dealing is really complex and careful work. And simply saying, well, you're a member of this non-affirming church, why don't you go to this affirming church, didn't do that work for them. And this is basically the, the way that I have uh, thought about the, the operation of these soul, uh, the soul violence on people. The feeling of being internally unmoored. This is Florence. Florence grew up in a Lutheran uh, household not a not affirming church. Um, Florence uh, was coming to a sense of her own lesbian identity throughout adolescence and into college, and in college sort of pronounced and claimed that uh, sexual identity for herself. And she had a suicide attempt not long after that in college. Uh, Florence is also one of the couple of people I interviewed who is theologically educated, um, really sophisticated theological framework which I think makes this statement all the more powerful to realize this, an ordained clergy person. 
that sense that you know as I was trying to own a lesbian identity, the sense that my soul was just sort of rotting, definitely led up to that being suicide. I would probably use the term spirit, but like that sense that the thing that was my center, my heart, my connection to the divine was just rotting away. I think the other thing that always sort of surprises me is how that feeling can reoccur. And those moments still take me by surprise. There'll still be the times when someone says something really homophobic and all of a sudden I'm back in that place again. This from someone with a really robust theological education who has done a lot of work to disentangle those life-giving and death-dealing narratives, who has produced work for others to do that kind of work for themselves, and still, Florence says, just a word, a phrase, can get her right back into that place again. This is how the, uh, the narrative material lives in us in ways that can become dangerous for us takes a lot of really careful work uh, to disentangle. I want to be sure, though, that we are not only talking about narratives of stress and trauma. And my colleague, Keith Menhenek, has this really beautiful way of describing queer resilience. And he writes his dissertation, which will soon be a book, uh, from the perspective of queer resilience. And just to sum it up, you know, he talks about moving from what's wrong with you to what's right with you, which is a really critical turn in writing about queer and trans lives, because a lot has been written about what is wrong with us, both really harmfully and really helpfully from people who are trying to address those harms. But Keith wants to look at what is right with us. And this is another story that many don't necessarily know, and I think it's a beautiful one, so I'll tell it to you as well. This happened in 1968 when a minister named Troy Perry uh, had been kicked out of, I think, his second church at this point when it was discovered that he was gay. And Perry went through a lot of anguished soul-searching about his life of faith and his sexual identity. And when you read that narrative, it sounds to me a lot like the anguished soul-searching of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and what Perry did uh, was in 1968... At the uh, uh, in an advertisement in the Advocate magazine, which is a really big, famous gay magazine, he put a notice in there and said, I'm going to have a group of people in my living room in L.A., and we're going to get together and have a worship service. Anybody that wants to come can come. And he did that, and he thought this was going to be a really great two-year experiment because in two years most of the denominations will have come around and gay and lesbian people will be a part of the denominations. So we'll do this two-year experiment in the living room. And of course, what uh, Perry founded became the Metropolitan Community Church. Now, the MCC is such an unusual and beautiful group because people came from, like Perry, very Pentecostal traditions. People came from very high church, Catholic and Episcopal traditions. And they made it work. Some people describe uh, MCC services as high church Pentecostalism. <laughs> um, they're really, I've been to uh, MCC churches all over the place and they're all very different and very unique, but they're people from various religious traditions who come together and bring the beauty of their traditions into that place. The other thing I want to say about MCC though, and this is really important because this doesn't get told in larger queer narratives of queer advocacy and history. The first building ever owned by a gay and lesbian organization was the first permanent sanctuary of the MCC in LA. The largest grassroots movement of LGBTQ people in the country, the MCC church. And if you know your queer history, 1968 is before Stonewall. And I think it's really beautiful to hear the story iterated that way, that before Stonewall, which was an incredibly important moment in modern queer history, before Stonewall, there was a church. There was a gathering in a living room to create a place of belonging for people and a place where people could seek a relationship with the divine outside the restricting dictates of the status quo of their denominations. Back to Florence. This is one of the ways in which 
Florence um, experienced uh, an, a, 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 the, the beginning of her own ability to hold her own against the violent theological narratives. We've seen the ways that the Eucharistic Catholic Church developed methods of holding their own against violence, spiritual violence, the way that Troy Perry and the early MCC Church did. This is how Florence did, all on her own. At this point, no one else was really a conversation partner with her about her faith and sexuality. She sang in her college choir, Lutheran College, and she said after our concert, uh, she had a solo this year, after the concert, the director came up to me and said, I think the reason you're so good at singing this is because you really believe it, and it just radiates out from the inside of you when you sing. And that was, I think, the point I thought there was something in me that's not just rotten, that there's maybe light in there. And it was kind of the affirmation of others that who I was came through what I was doing, that, what, that it wasn't just a facade, and I could really believe that was part of who I was. Her choir director had no idea what she was going through. But 30 years later, she's telling the story as a turning point in her life when she could start to believe that there was something in her that wasn't just rotten. Uh, another really great story about Florence growing up in this, you know, rather conservative Lutheran household. She really wanted, as a teenager, to do her service learning that she had to do at school at, a, at a, an AIDS um, crisis center in the inner city. This was in the 90s. Her parents forbade it, of course. She wasn't out yet, but she knew there was something about going there that was going to help her figure something out about herself, and she really wanted to be helpful. Every day, she left the house to go to whatever the service learning thing that she actually signed up for was, but she would instead go to the train, take it to the inner city, and volunteer for a year at this AIDS crisis center in the inner city. All of my participants developed some sort of really altruistic, other-centered spiritual practices. And for Florence, it developed really early. Um, Thomas, again, the person you met earlier, when we were closing our interview. Uh, Thomas started to talk about his other-centered, sort of altruistic way of understanding his spiritual life. He said, now I'm in a position where I don't want the kingdom to come sometime in the future anymore. I want it to be right here, right now. Wherever we are, with whomever we're working, it's a life choice. I want to do this on purpose now. I don't want to plan as if the kingdom is sometime far out. I don't want to plan as if God is going to save us someday. I think... God already did it, and we just have to help people live through it. From a theological perspective, that sort of sounds like a realized eschatology, you know. And at the end of our interview, I said, I mean, his theological framework was so rich and beautiful and robust. I said, Thomas, it sounds like you've read a lot of queer theology. And Thomas said, what is queer theology? Thomas had spent 30 years of his life outside of any Christian community doing his relationship with God on his own. In fact, he iterated this more clearly than anybody else in my uh, research. He said, you know, if abandoning Christian community so that I could follow Christ was what I had to do, then that's what I would do. He actually said, F it. I would leave the church and follow Jesus. And he did that for 30 years. He talked about the Bible like a backpack he carries around that he opens when he needs the spiritual tools that it contains for him. He talked about prayer in ways that I never hear anybody in church talk about prayer. Really deep, prayerful experiences with God. And he was doing this on his own for 30 years. Um, that's a story of beauty a story of resilience, a story of resistance uh, to the soul violence that he experienced in his early Christian communities. Brooke Peterson at Lutheran uh, Theological School in, in uh, Chicago says this in her book, and it's really important for us, I think, for many of you in this uh, room coming from Christian communities, for many of her participants, and she really was looking at the return to churches, for many of her participants in the study, the loss of ritual space, where they were baptized, where they received communion, where they met the divine, was one of the most significant parts of their loss, estranged from their access to a ritual community, with the blame for that loss placed firmly on themselves. 
that's helpful to read other people's research because it, it helps you to see things that you didn't even see about yourself. And I got to thinking after I read this, you know, I don't have a home church anymore. I can't go back to the place where I was baptized, where I took communion with my family, where my family had been for generations. There would be no recognition of my belonging in that place. So when we're thinking about people's ability to come back or to try out a new community, I want to invite you to see this uh, ritual piece of it as a really important one and one that also has to do with our sense of being out of time because ritual, sacraments, the things that we do in our Sunday morning gatherings connects us to communities across time. And to be severed from that kind of relationship to ritual life can also be a, an experience of stress and or trauma. In this regard, I think this is illustra illustrative of temporal trauma. Now, if you Google temporal trauma, what you get is articles about trauma to the temporal lobe. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. Again, nobody's quite written about temporal trauma like this either, so I'm, I'm testing this out a bit with you. I think of temporal trauma as being in an instilled sense that you are not a part of anyone's story, devoid of a narrative self and community, and or the instilled sense that there is no more story of you to be told, what Mark Friedman calls narrative foreclosure that your story has an end point and that you've reached it. And for most of my participants, that is the experience that I found in their story, that they came to a, a point when they thought that their story had ended. And I didn't connect it back then, but I am connecting it now to the ways that they were also out of a timeline because they didn't know who they were connected to in pasts either. So it works in the past and future tense, this sort of chrono stress and temporal trauma. I want to tell you about another gathering of people that I think were really addressing temporal trauma. And this was uh, 1986, San Francisco, the Castro. My friend, who I got to work with for a couple of years in Boston, Jim Matulski, was called as a 27-year-old, I think, to pastor the MCC church in San Francisco. So almost entirely LGBTQ people in this church. In the gayest neighborhood in the world in 1986, four years into the AIDS epidemic. The church shaped its ritual around the experience of AIDS because AIDS dominated that church's life for the 10 years that Jim was the pastor there. It was um, visible in the ways that men would come to church with their IV poles uh, some would have to lay down on the pews during the service because they were just too physically exhausted to even sit up. Um, a historian friend, Lynn Gerber, has listened to all the tapes of the services from those, uh, those days. Um, and she talks about how in, in those tape services, you'll just hear constantly people's watches going off over and over again as reminders to take their AZT. That was the only drug really that was available at that point for treating HIV. And they shaped the ritual around that lived experience of, of people dying of HIV and AIDS. And people came together and formed community at the margins of the communities that had marginalized them, when the government wanted them dead, when churches did not want them in the pews, when families refused to even acknowledge the existence of their gay kids who were dying of AIDS, when doctors and nurses didn't want to treat them, when funeral directors didn't want to handle their bodies. They formed communities in order to hold people, in order to usher people into death in basically what were you know, self-organized hospices. Lesbian communities had a really big role to play in taking care of uh, dying gay men in that era. But at the MCC Church in San Francisco, they did several things. You know, uh, This was the first time when at communion, which keeps coming up in these stories, it was the first time people ever experienced getting to go to the communion table with their same sex partner or, you know, with their partner and their sister who came to town and their ex who was still their best friend and their roommate, you know, to come together as a family unit uh, to the communion table in that way. They also started incorporating laying on of hands at communion because this was a time when nobody wanted to touch 
gay men dying of AIDS. And so after communion, you would go to a, and I have still experienced this in most MCC churches that I've been to. You take communion and then you go over here and there's a minister there to lay hands on you in an act of blessing or an act of healing. One of the few times, you know, when some gay men would be touched by someone else. Um, and at one point, this is a great story, I won't tell the whole thing, but at one point uh, in the early 90s, there was a mother of a man who had died of AIDS at that church, and she would stand at the other side of the communion table with little bags of marijuana, because there was nothing else to deal with the pain of dying of AIDS except marijuana. And California hadn't legalized it yet, but here was this mother and Jim Matulski, you know, communion, healing, marijuana, and you go. And if you couldn't come to the service, if you couldn't come to the service, they would come to your house and give you communion and a blessing and a tape of the service. Um, in 10 years, Jim was the pastor there. He got there in 1986. There were 50 members of the church. In 10 years, he had buried 1,000 church members. More funerals than anyone else has ever done for men dying of AIDS there at that congregation. In Christmas 1986, I mean, sorry, 1989, it was a hard year. Um, this was still a little ways out from the cocktail that would eventually be helpfully treating HIV. There were a lot of kind of, um, there's a lot of back and forth about uh, domestic partnership laws in California. They would be passed and then they would be repealed on the ballot. I mean, it was a really tough year for queer folks. and. You know, this was the probably largest collection of queer people in one church in the world at that time. And Jim needed to figure out what to say on Christmas. And he preached a sermon called, Who, uh, sorry, We Who Must Die Demand a Miracle. And in that service, he does what he's so good at doing. I'd love for you to hear Jim preach. He's now back in California in Oakland. Um, he preaches extemporaneously from his big Bible is falling apart. And he preached a sermon where he, he read the story of Mary and Joseph and Jesus as this unwed domestic partner, you know, configuration, having this baby, to this congregation of dying people who were abandoned by the structures of society that were to protect them. And he read this story in light of their experience because he wanted to show them that they were part of history. And they were part of God's story. And that their story mattered to God because God used people like the people in that church to do the work of the gospel. These are the stories I want us to recover because queer people need these stories and the church needs these stories of faithfulness and courage. I learned this story from Lynn Gerber. I'll link a couple of things in the bibliography for her that you'll have access to later. She is uncovering a lot of stories of churches during the AIDS epidemic. Um, and I think you'd be inspired to listen or read any of them. So talk a little bit about this resilience, resi resilient adaptation, critical resilient adaptation um, progression here. I won't go too much into it, but it's another continuum I'm trying to work on a bit. Um, the resilience, I think, is evident in a lot of the participants that I had who just figured out how to move around some theological pieces of their framework so that they could basically stay theologically at home where they already were. Maybe not in the same church, but like I had an evangelical Christian who when she iterated her theology now, it still sounded very, very, very evangelical, just really clearly affirming of her sexuality. There were others who I thought about as being more uh, in this category of resilient adaptation. So a more pronounced shift after this period of deep exploration of religious and spiritual life and values. There was one um, participant who had had five or six suicide attempts in his life, um, and he decided he really had to do something. He was 20-something when this uh, was happening. He had to do something different. And so he lived in a pretty big city. He called up a rabbi and an imam and a Catholic priest and a Buddhist priest, and he just went around to every religious house of worship he could find and interviewed the person to figure out where he might be able to belong and practice a, practice a spirituality, because he couldn't remain in the church where he was that was continuously uh, perpetuating this soul violence. And then I think about this other category of cr critical resilient adaptation. 
that was the participants who started pulling at some threads and they realized if they kept pulling at the thread, the whole thing was gonna come apart and they either had to stop or keep going and see what happened. And some of them kept going and Juliana, this is another participant who was theologically educated, she said, well, when you have a glaring issue like that, that, everyone, that everything you're told about it doesn't add up or that you can't make it go away or that it's a sin and any of these things, and all those things are under question, and you begin to interrogate those questions, then the whole thing has to crumble because you can either keep questioning or not. And she and some others kept questioning, and their religious spiritual life sort of came apart in some helpful ways, and they put it back together again in a different configuration. And no judgment value about any of these because they were all strategies for surviving and flourishing. And some of them worked well for some participants and others for uh, other participants. But if you're working with LGBTQ people around reconfiguring a spiritual religious life in the aftermath of soul violence or stress or trauma, keep in mind that there are different ways of doing this. Some will just need to tinker with the theology a little bit. And that might be all they can really do. But if that helps them to survive, great. Some will need to go on a little bit more of a search for a community that they can belong to because they know more than a few little theological uh, details need to change. And some, and for my participants, it was mostly the people who decided to get a theological degree. Some needed to take the whole house apart and then rebuild it again. Really helpful if you have a conversation partner in this, especially a conversation partner who gets spiritual care and who gets uh, this kind of intricate theological work. People like you. Um, Brooke Peterson, again, I just wanna shift this to the church, the people like you part of this. Uh, it's imperative that the accepting church, so she's talking about affirming churches here, recognize the power of trauma for many LGBTQIA people while also acknowledging their own historical proclamation of theology, which has in many cases also supported that religious trauma. Um, this is where I think the possibility of moral injury comes in. And I'm testing this out. I've never really worked with moral injury frameworks before. And I'm not quite seeing how, the, how they applied to this until recently. So curious to hear what you think about this. This is uh, Yen, Matt Yandel. Um, Moral injury is about human relationships. It's not merely a wound on the inside of a person belonging solely to an individual. There's a sense in which moral injury exists outside the individual belonging to many people at once. And lately I have been thinking about the ways that churches, predominantly straight churches, you know, not the MCC or the Eucharistic Catholic Church, that predominantly straight churches become at some point affirming of LGBTQ people and what they then do with the entire history of their existence when they weren't affirming of LGBTQ people. Like my church that I served in Cambridge, we became affirming in 1983, which is probably the first Baptist church in the whole country and before many, before most denominations even were talking about LGBTQ people. And we had it on a sign or two every now and then, you know, celebrating LGBTQ lives since 1983, which is remarkable. But I always thought that says something about where we were before 1983 that I'm not proud of. And I don't know what kind of work that does on us as a collective body when we have to reckon with the fact that even if we are in an affirming place now, we have a history of complicity and religious violence. And I wonder if moral injury could be one framework for thinking about how that works on us. I think about all, you know, there are lots of reasons people leave churches. But I think about a lot of people who leave churches because they can't be in a place that disparages LGBTQ people that they love anymore. And I wonder if that movement is to save themselves from the moral injury of continuously being complicit in anti-LGBTQ soul violence. I don't know. And I don't really know quite how to study this notion either. Um, but the other thing I've been wondering about recently, and I'd love to hear some feedback about this in the future, is that I work with a lot of churches over time that have become affirming, done really good critical work to become affirming. And then they like bury that story four pages deep into their website and they don't have any signage or any 
any signs people can recognize. And by the way, people don't know what more light or reconciling or welcoming and affirming. People don't know what any of that means unless you're inside those denominations. So even putting that on the sign doesn't mean a whole lot in terms of what it signals to people. And I wonder sometimes if it is our moral injury as a congregation that keeps us from wanting to tell that story of affirmation too publicly because then it also calls into question the history of complicity before that decision was made. It's an idea I'm testing out. I'd love to hear what you think about that. And if you have any idea about how to study that in congregations, I'd really love to, to think about that with you. All right, I think we're getting toward the end. Okay, good. Um, so la last piece here. This is from Ju uh, Judith Herman, who's the probably leading trauma scholar in the world, next to Bezel, Bezel van der Kolk. She says, a large body of research has now documented facts that make intuitive sense that social support is a powerful predictor of good recovery, while social isolation is toxic. I don't have much time to go through this, but I want to just read these uh, four uh, things that she uh, suggests survivors of various kinds of trauma need. Uh, first, she says, if trauma shames and isolates, then recovery must take place in community. That's why I want us to think about this in terms of our church's uh, responsibility in addressing stress and trauma for LGBTQ people. Survivors need uh, to focus on the complex and demanding task of establishing safety in the present. That's the work of churches actually embodying the affirmation we hold so that people can come into the congregation and know they're not going to experience microaggressions against LGBTQ people, that they're going to hear things that actually affirm their beingness in the world. Survivors may revisit the past in order to grieve and make meaning of the experience of stress and trauma, to forge new identities that neither denies the past nor totalizes them by it. That's the really careful pastoral work, I think, of working with people around these traumas. Survivors refocus on the present and the future, expanding and deepening relationships with wider community and expanded possibilities for life. And then she added this in her most recent book. If trauma is a social problem, the wounds are part of a social ecology of violence, then full healing must require repair and justice from a larger community. And that is, I think, where ecclesial communities come into play. That we're not just places of affirmation where an LGBTQ, people might, uh, LGBTQ person might stumble in the door every now and then, but that we figure out how to become communities of repair and justice for LGBTQ people. In an era when in a month and a half, 398 laws have been introduced in legislatures across the country to target us. So I'll tell you one story about this and then we'll call it... Uh, quits for this and move into some responses. This was a, a story told to me by my friend Keith that I've talked about before. Uh, when he was a student in the uh, mid-2000s or so in at Wake Forest Divinity School, great Baptist school in North Carolina, they had a student group, LGBTQ student group called um, Kaleidoscope. And one year, and I think maybe multiple years, they would go to Pride with this group, Winston-Salem Pride, and they would have a reverse confessional. This is where the attendees of Pride could come to one of the ministers or seminarians, and the minister or seminarian would confess the church's sin to them and say things like, I'm sorry for the ways that we have lied about you. I'm sorry for the ways we have lied to you. I'm sorry for the ways that the church has been complicit in violence against you. And Keith said that experience was full of tears, was full of laughter, uh, forged new relationships. That's not something that everyone's going to do. Never every church will do that. But I do wonder how, as congregations and communities of faith, institutions, we do practice repentance for the harms we've done in the past. And we do that work of repair that has to be done at that level of the aura of deep myth, the heart of our humanness, our soul for LGBTQ people. One story that I think illustrates that, but there are many others and you probably know a lot of them. But now I wanna turn it over to Isaac Horwadell, who is my great colleague here, who uh, will respond to this and then we'll have some conversation.
Uh, just as in words of introduction, come on up. Uh, Isaac is the visiting assistant professor of ethics and uh, Louisville Institute postdoctoral fellow. Um, I feel like I got really lucky when I came to Luther to start here with Isaac because I got a really amazing um, seminary community, really amazing students and colleagues, and a really, really good friend in Isaac. And so I'm so lucky to work alongside him. And when his dissertation is published on the relationship between addiction and capitalism, it is going to truly um, kind of revolutionize the field of pastoral theology and, and uh, counseling with regard to addiction. So I can't wait for you to read that work when it comes out. Yeah, ask him, you know, when it's coming, when you see him. Uh, Isaac, thank you for reading this book and for responding to it. And here you can get my bibliography for the talk too. for that introduction, Cody. Um, and um, quickly, just want to thank everyone involved in putting this event together. It involved a lot of people, um, students, staff, faculty. So thanks, thanks to everyone involved in that. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, it's an honor to respond to Cody and this wonderful, challenging um, book and project that this talk was based on and this, this talk itself, which was very um, helpful. Um, my response is kind of divided into two parts, and I'm largely responding to the book that um, uh, this is based on, but also the talk as I heard it for the first time. Um, and I just want to emphasize this is one person's response from um, my own uh, um, interests, and I'm, I know there are lots of people in the room with um, diverse interests, so I hope our conversation afterward um, can be fruitful for all of you, and this is just my response to kind of get us going. Um, the, my remarks are kind of divided into two parts. First, um, what I see as um, three kind of problematic assumptions that I think Cody names in this um, book that come from this research, and then three subsequent correctives that I think Cody puts forward. Um, and after going through those assumptions and correctives, um, I've just named some of what I see as the major, some major implications for our time and place. Um, and I think what's so helpful about this book is that Cody also names some of his own assumptions, the way that assumptions seep into our narratives, even those of us who kind of consider ourselves on the, the, the cutting edge or the front side of these issues, that we still have these assumptions that come into how we retell stories, how we think about um, people, specifically LGBTQ people, in relation to the church or Christianity more broadly. Um, the first one comes from this uh, concept of theological doublespeak, which there's a lot you can do with this concept, and there's um, one particular way I've responded to it. Um, just to quote from the book, um, Cody writes, condemnatory denigrating theological messages hold so much power to damage because other more positive and sustaining theological narratives are so constitutively central to many LGBTQ people's sense of being and purpose. And I think one of the kind of sneaky things um, about this, a sneaky kind of assumption, is that LGBTQ Christians, especially those who have experienced trauma, have kind of um, more or less located themselves on the fringes of the tradition. Um, that all things being equal, queer Christians are sort of Christians in a qualified sense. They're, they sort of have an asterisk by them due to um, all sorts of factors. And I think the assumption there is that at the end of the day, the core of Christianity is more or less straight. That the norm is straight. If we don't say anything else, all things being equal. Um, 
And that because of this, um, one, queer Christians will just necessarily have a harder time reconciling themselves with Christianity. Um, and that others won't. Others who aren't queer won't have that difficulty. And even more problematic, that um, that's primarily the work they need to do. Figure out how to reconcile yourselves with the tradition or leave it or, um, or uh, be okay on the fringes of it, on the margins of it, not in the core of it. I think the corrective, one of the correctives, is just this insistence, and it comes in the narratives and in Cody's own um, insistence, that queer Christians are no less invested in the church, no less formed by the church, by the tradition, by the theologies. They have been constituted at its margins. They have been marginalized. And I think this is maybe obvious to a lot of us, but just worth repeating and insisting on that narrative that um, this is something that has been done socially and historically to people. Um, in chapter five, um, Cody writes, it's not entirely accurate to say that these individuals left the church. They were left by the church or, or pushed out of the church. And that this, this process is not reducible to over, overt or explicit condemnation of queer sexuality or identity. It's in the subtleties of our language, in the stories we do and don't tell, the symbols we do and don't use or allow, the stances we do or don't take as, as institutions and as individuals. Um, but as, as Cody's reminded us, these stories and these people belong to the church, whether we, we, um, everyone in the church wants them to belong. So um, it matters how we, how we narrate that. I think all, throughout the, the book also, um, Cody emphasizes the limits of binaries um, on matters of significance. That's my attempt to summarize that. Um, he writes, it's surprising that very few of the participants spoke of their experience with the clear binary language that the dichotomy um, in versus out, of, or the, the dichotomy of the closet, right? So the, the problematic assumption is that queer people's lives follow a more or less linear path of being in the closet until they come out of the closet. Um, and I think uh, for Christians, uh, queer Christians, there's a tendency to um, force that, uh, that linear uh, path onto their sort of relation to Christianity as well. So queer Christians are in the closet, they come out, and then they must decide, are you going to stay in the church or are you going to leave the church? Um, and th there's these sort of two binary um, things that happen on this linear path. Um, I think the corrective, uh, um, Cody talks about feelings of hiddenness, feelings of being trapped, a much greater sense of fluidity, complexity, and chaos um, related to their sexual identity of the people, related to their, um, their notions of Christianity, uh, their place within Christianity, their place within the church. Um, and the interviewees repeatedly highlight um, the much more significant stakes than this all takes when it, when it um, has this theological weight, not just a matter of disclosure, I'm in or out, I'm gay or straight, um, but the whole trajectory of their lives. And I think um, throughout the book, um, all of these things, um, non-queer people have a lot to learn about these as well when it comes to how we narrate our own faith um, journeys or our relation to the church. Um, so I think there's kind of um, multiple applications. Uh, lastly, um, um, very interesting, we touched on this, I'm still trying to figure out for myself what I even think about this, um, but I found it compelling on how we think of uh, LGBTQ theological work, queer theological work. Um, Cody writes, I must emphasize that the deliberative human activity directed toward criticizing and reconstructing the symbols by which faith lives. So that's, that's theological 
activity, the deliberative human activity directed toward criticizing and reconstructing the symbols by which faith lives, is the very work that these participants are doing in their own lives. Um, responding with resistance to theological symbols that no longer facilitate the livability of life and often work to diminish that livability. So, um, how I understand that, there is an assumption, I think, that critically thinking through one's sexuality, one's sexual identity, um, yeah, in relation to Christianity or not, is somehow separate from, at, 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 at least, or at most, a threat to the work of theology proper. That thinking through a queer identity is somehow separate from theology, real theological work. Um, and or that theology proper is kind of reducible to um, constructing positive theological proposals and propositions that we do or don't assent to or agree with. Um, throughout these stories, we see critical self-reflexive work that merges with or makes room for um, more traditional theological work or self-understanding. So multiple examples where individuals, um, which um, we also got in this talk, had to kind of go away before they could return to the church, but that going away was no less theologically rich, no less theologically complex, um, no less rigorous. Um, and they returned to the church, to the study of scripture, to more overt forms of Christianity, only after they had found the freedom, space, and community to rework and remember um, their own narratives as LGBTQ people. So, um, the ways we sometimes um, overly um, divide up the, this kind of work and this sort of self-reflexive work from uh, theology. So I think, um, are we out on time? Yeah, why don't you open it up to wrap up? I'll, so I'll, yeah, I'll wrap up as quickly as I can. So I think um, one of the major things I take from this here today at this institution, and all of you can think about this for your institutions, is that I think this book challenges us to critically and carefully consider the narratives and stories that make us who we are, that, um, that have formed us as people, as institutions, and as churches. Whose stories um, go into that narrative? Who is included and who is excluded in these stories? Where and how do these stories um, feature or not feature LGBTQ persons? whether in the past or in the present, where do they fit in, and what is our responsibility to those who have been excluded and marginalized? Um, what is our responsibility in terms of giving them a role in um, remembering or retelling or telling new stories as they um, live within our community? So um, I think I'll stop there and we can go to questions and I can bring these things up, my other thoughts if we need to. So. And we have um, two microphones if you have questions or comments for Cody. And then we have Sandy who has our Zoom questions if they come up. So yeah, feel free to come up here. Make sure they're on. Mike's I think they're, they're on. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Melissa Harrell Solo. I want to thank both of you. Um, very, very stimulating and, and important work. Thank you. I, I especially was thinking, Cody, when you got to the moral injury part, and I haven't yet had a chance to read the book, by the way, um, about how intersectional that kind of work can be. That um, in my own experience as a white Christian woman of transgender experience, I feel very deeply, as most of us do, the the bodily violence against black trans women and um, economic justice issues, housing issues, health access. And um, I just wanted to raise the question of having a, a more interwoven, intersectional approach to things like moral injury. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And the moral injury piece is something I'm kind of 
testing out now. That's not in the book. Um, but a lot of my colleagues who've been really interested in moral injury have helped me to think about the ways that that might be applicable here. And yeah, I mean, the intersectional nature of this work is a really important one. Our experience as, you know, a white cis gay man is really different from a black trans woman and our socioeconomic status cushions us from some things that others aren't shielded from. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, doesn't, I don't do that work in the book, but I think it's really important work for churches to do when they're thinking about our work of repair and justice, uh, to do that through an intersectional framework. And the really nice thing is that there are so many resources now for congregations written from intersectional justice frameworks that you know we don't have to wade through really uh, thick philosophical theory to figure out what intersectionality means. There are theologians who are helping us to know what that means for us in our in our contexts right now. Um, you know, and I'll lift up the work of uh, Matt Lewinotten here, who's a religious organizer for Outfront Minnesota. Outfront is the organization that does a lot of the legislative uh, activism work in Minnesota to keep some really bad laws from getting passed, because there are some really bad laws proposed right now in Minnesota against LGBTQ people. Uh, and also it helps really good laws get passed. Um, so I, yeah, and, and the work, as he came to my class yesterday and talked about it with my students, is I think really intersectional work in, in a lot of ways that you're doing. Yeah, thanks. David? Oh. I have 12 pages of notes here. Okay, well, let's we'll just time. start with the beginning and we'll see how far we can get. I'm Dave and I'm a graduate of this fine institution, yeah. left the ministry when I came out in uh, 1994. Um, as I jokingly tell people, I gave it up for Lent, uh, but that's not quite true. The decision wasn't mine. Uh, there were so many things that came to my mind as you both spoke. Um, one of the things, and uh, this is probably reflective of my own state of mind and my own spiritual walk, whatever, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, Q plus community has been expected to come and play nice. The church looks and says, you're welcome back as long as you're nice and behave well. And being a child of the 50s and 60s, I knew all what it was to be all about being nice. I think one of the reasons that we resist us coming back is there's some terror of our rage. They are afraid of the rage that we're going to bring and the hurt and the anger. And by in my own experience, and my background is in the stoic Norwegian Lutheran church, I'll own it. Healthy, not so much, but that's what it is. Um, strong emotions were, there was a terror of strong emotions and the consideration that you were out of control. What do we do? And, and by virtue of that, that gets imposed upon the figure of Christ, who had a few strong feelings during the course of his ministry. But we don't want that. We worship something else. We worship uniformity. We worship everybody being the same. And as a result of that, when a member of the LGBTQ plus community comes in, they are immediately branded as other. Now, the work, who's going to do the work? Do we do the work in order for them to say, to get it? Or do they figure out, and what is the magical inspiration for them to get that they have part of that work to do? Um, I don't know where the answer is. I do have to tell you, I can't wait to read read what you're writing. A long time ago, I wrote a book by uh, Ann Wilson Schaaf called When Society Becomes an Addict. And she talks about this very thing. The norm is we declare what is the norm and everybody else is crazy, which is classic addictive thinking. So I'll be really interested to see what you have there. So I'll leave the other 11 pages of notes. And we'll just kind of <laughs> okay. We'll talk about those later. Uh, yeah, and his work is so brilliant. I can't wait for you to read it. Um, I think it's a really important question in a lot of ways. I mean, when you said, when you were talking about that initially, I remember this one guy, really, I mean, affirming minister who has sacrificed a lot for his affirming views. So I know his place that he's coming from. Uh, and one time he told me about a church I belonged to a long time ago. He said, I'm really glad that church has you as an example of a gay person because you're so normal. I'm like, Yeah. There are, there are certain things I'm not, my body isn't bringing into the church that challenges them in different ways. I think that could be race, race, class, but maybe also anger, rage, things of that nature. And generally, I think it's important for churches, especially right now, when the world is on the brink, 
in terms of climate, in terms of political turmoil, in terms of the acceleration of AI beyond our capacity to ethically deal with it, uh, that we need to be really attentive to our, the range of emotions that we are able to contain and hold and work with in church contexts. Fear, anger, and sadness, I think, are the three really difficult ones that we don't do very well with. Sadness, a little bit. Fear and anger, not as much. Uh, all of these emotional experiences are iterated in the Bible in really beautiful ways. But, you know, when, um, when we don't let those, when we let those emotional experiences just sort of take their course and they're not treated with care, um, anger becomes like what we're seeing in the public domain at this point. I mean, an intractable kind of opposition to others. Fear causes us to sort of retreat into ourselves. Sadness sort of dulls our ability to engage in community. So I think part of the work is just the general work for churches to be able to bring these emotional experiences into a communal context in, in some ritual ways, especially, uh, and to let them happen in a, in a spiritually caring community. But I also think we need to cultivate some different kinds of emotions, like uh, grief. I mean, I, I think part of the work of addressing the rage is addressing the grief that has never been able to be ritually expressed over what we as churches, for example, have done to perpetuate violence over uh, violence against LGBTQ people. There are a lot of lives that we we can't grieve. And so not being able to grieve means we come in so angry at everybody we've lost and nobody is recognizing this, but grieving that together, I think, is an important part of it. Gratitude is another one. Uh, what, what things, like these stories that I told, do we have to be grateful for in the lives of queer and trans people and queer and trans churches? How could we iterate those things in a you know, a predominantly straight church context that's affirming of LGBTQ people in ways that remembers bringing those people back into the narrative uh, arc of our community out of a sense of gratitude for what they did and who they were and who they are and what they've done to help us understand our faith and our sexuality better. I mean, I don't think straight and cisgender people would understand our sexualities and genders very well at all if it weren't for queer and trans people who have been helping everybody to understand our bodies better than, than we have been. And wonder. That, I think, is a really complex emotional experience and one of the most, for me, important spiritual emotional experiences that Abraham Joshua Heschel called radical amazement, that a third century Sanskrit text talks about as a primary emotion. Western psychologists don't talk about wonder as a primary emotion. Third century Sanskrit text talks about wonder as the emotion of seeing divinely. How do the stories of LGBTQ people become a part of our wondering together at what God is up to in the world? What kind of wonder is provoked in us when we hear the story of the Eucharistic Catholic Church or the MCC Church um, or all sorts of little churches all over the place that have done really beautiful and radical and amazing things, but no one knows about them. And they could be sources of real wonder for what the divine is up to in the world around us. I think broadening this to contain the breadth and the continuum of human emotions in some really ritual and sacred ways can help to, to can help us when we come back to a faith community full of anger because we know but no one else is recognizing the pain that has been caused in that in that regard gosh that's a good question i need to think more about it one thing i'd add to that um, becomes very clear in the book from most of the stories is that um it wasn't just issues around sexuality that they, um, where they came into conflict in their communities. Many of them were labeled rebellious or they were difficult just because they were raising questions or critiques or had, um, were unsatisfied in some way with what that community provided. So I think it, um, challenging faith communities to think with real theological imagination about how to um, not just make room for critique or dissent or questioning, but to have a posture of um, 
Um, that that's part of the living tradition, is thinking critically about it, questioning it, um, having room for people who uh, are really feeling at odds with it without always externalizing those people, like kicking them out or, or um, um, thinking they somehow um, don't have the, the, the sort of community in mind um, when they're raising those questions. Well, you're, you're not being too comfortable. I come to church to be comfortable. <laughs> and now you're taking my comfort away from you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Lois. I, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on these two comments. One of the things that was really, um, to me, that spoke to me, Cody, in your presentation, is that you were continually setting the LGBTQ experience, plus experience, with also the church. And so in many ways, what I, what I heard in your presentation is that the LGBTQ community was calling the church to a more authentic Christianity. Mm -hmm. Because so many of the practices that you were outlining that were practices of repair, of addressing moral in injury, of practices of return, mm -hmm. estrangement and then return, those are true of so many other people, right. not yeah. just the LGBTQ community. So, yeah. so many of us have anger, have sadness, have rage for a range of different reasons. And I just wonder if you could comment on that, on how, for whatever reason, it's calling us to a deeper understanding that, yes, scripture is all about the full complexity of emotions that we have. And that the church ritually is a place for a where we encounter God with one another to address that, to address the pain. That, so if you could talk about kind of like the particularity, of the uniqueness of the LGBTQ experience, which is not everybody's experience, but at the same time, yeah. it kind of calls the rest of us yeah. into a, a, a deeper understanding of how God is at work today. Yeah. Gosh, yeah, that's really interesting. That's, uh, uh, it reminds me of a phrase of one queer theologian who I can't remember who said this, uh, but she, uh, she talked about the ways that uh, queer people's imaginations have had to flourish out in the margins because we haven't been able to you know, bring our queer imagination into the center of most churches and ecclesial groups. And I think at the margins, sort of outside the dictates of the status quo, that kind of imagination flourishes in ways that can call the church to be you know, more genuinely Christian or more creative and imaginative about the ways we live out the gospel and things of that nature. But there has to be an uptake, you know. Churches, on the whole, have to have some way of listening to the voices of queer people. I listen to the voices of queer individuals, but you know, like the entire bookshelf in my office is devoted to queer theological work, and queer theologians are, I think, doing some of the most incredible uh, uh, imaginative, creative work in theological academy in every field and discipline now. Uh, Jimmy Hoke, who's here right now, does a queer New Testament scholarship, and there are people who are writing things that the whole church needs to hear and read if there's some uptake to, to do that. Um, I think there are, there are some really interesting differences that are helpful to think about between the ways, like churches also need to hear from, you know, Native American communities and Christianities and black liberation strands of Christianity and a whole lot of uh, discourses that we have sort of marginalized and kept in sort of special categories of theology. I think one of the helpful things to think about around, uh, with queer uh, people and churches is that most of us are not born into a family that can help us know something about ourselves. Like, uh, a Native American person being born into a family where their, their stories are passed down and their parents reflect something about them and there's a, there's a lineage that you almost automatically belong to at the margins often, but a continual kind of, this is the chronostress, I think, piece of it. But for queer people, like, you know, I, th I, I think about my own growing up, um, I somehow, even though my church really didn't preach anti-LGBTQ stuff, they just didn't talk about it at all, somehow the message that there was something wrong with me because of my same-sex attraction found me. I knew there was something that I shouldn't talk about around my sexuality from elementary school. 
And I don't know how that part of the collective library got into my inner library, because I'm pretty sure I never heard it explicitly. But it got in there, and I didn't have anybody who could help me figure that out. Um, and then when I think about the ways I first found that there were Christian communities and churches that were affirming of LGBTQ people and uh, had LGBTQ pastors and things like that, I had to go find that. Those stories didn't find me. So there is a really important way in which I think queer people come into the world cut off from a larger narrative and a chronology that they belong to, and we have to find it and find our people and find people who reflect something about us and find people who will tell us the stories that we belong to. Um, yeah, I mean, that's maybe not exactly what you were asking in the question, but I, every single one of my participants became what I thought of as transgressive theologians for the livability of life because they had to. There was no other choice. They tried to die by suicide. None of my participants obviously did. So if they were gonna live, they had to do some theological work in order to survive. Um, and most of them did it without any of the formal queer theological work because no one was around to tell them there's this whole body of work and whole lineage you belong to and we can help you know those stories. Um, so yeah, churches need to hear queer people's stories and queer theology, but churches, I think, also need to be the conduits through which those stories reach queer people by telling these, letting them circulate in our, in our sacred communities. Good afternoon, and Cody, thank you. Um, I got to meet Cody through a natural burial presentation we were giving, some colleagues of mine that he came to. Um, so grateful to be here, and I'm curious to hear more about suicide. And as someone who is queer and theologically trained, the two lenses that come to mind that I wonder, because I'm sure you could say a lot about suicide, but the two lenses that came to mind for me are one is that notion of narrative foreclosure, and the other, based on my own research as a chaplain, and um, is this notion of the cost of resilience. So resilience costs. And I wonder if either of those lenses are ones you want to speak to suicide through. Yeah. Narrative foreclosure was a really important way that I understood what I was hearing from the participants in my, in my research. Um, most of them came to a point at which they thought there was no more narrative of them to be told in the, in the world anymore. Um, they, and this is another part of temporal trauma, that there, there was no imagination about what a future could look like for them. And that was a big part of their experience leading up to a suicide attempt. There were other parts of it too, like some of them iterated the fact that their life was a living hell and they couldn't take it anymore and, and they needed to, uh, and it really interestingly, so this dichotomy I found in some stories, one th thought, if I'm going to hell anyway, uh, and my life is a living hell right now, so I might as well kill myself. Another participant iterated, I know God loves me and will embrace me in my death, and no one here does, so I'll kill myself, so that I can at least be with a God who loves me. So that operated really differently on people's considerations for why suicide was a thinkable option, but the narrative foreclosure is a really big piece of it, and I think a big piece of the pastoral work in that regard is helping people to uh, attach their narrative to a past and to a future where there are possibilities. And that was Judith Herman's, I think, third point in, in recovery from trauma is being able to see possibilities for futures that exist. And, you know, for my participants, it was all about this feeling of being trapped, being hidden, um, being condemned at a constitutive level. So that's, I mean, that's all theological work that needs to take place uh, for and with queer people. Um, what was the second part of your question? What cost of resilience? Oh, resilience, yeah. I've resisted resilience for a while now because I'm troubled by the way resilience is often talked about as a way of dealing with all of the stresses and distress and trauma that we might encounter at places, but we should just be resilient and never address the root 
causes of the stress trauma that we experience in the first place. We should just summon the energy that it takes to bounce back. Um, so I, I really appreciate the way Judith Herman writes about this because she talks about the recovery from trauma as a communal practice. It should not just land on the individual to be resilient. It should be a communal practice of resilience where we're building the structures for people to be able to do the theological work they need to do to reconstitute their, their connection to community and to the divine, to be a place where they can see themselves reflected in others, to be places where they can attach their story to a larger narrative arc. I think all those parts for me now are how I think about resilience. Um, that there isn't really something called resilience. Resilience is just naming this cadre of practices and, and things that we need in relation in order to live and survive and thrive in the face of stress and trauma. But as Herman says, if we're relating the traumas that we experience to an ecology of violence, we have to do something about the violence too. And that's more than resilience, that's structural justice kinds of work. If you're interested in land conservation, natu natural burial, I have three representatives here of the land conservation, natural burial group in Minnesota, Rosalie. And we need to also see if Sandy has questions from the, online too. Okay, great. Great. Last question. Um, first, I want to say thank you for bringing um, this topic specifically into this space um, here on our seminary campus. Um, I'm appreciative of this being here. Um, I'm curious, uh, in light of some of the different types of trauma you address today, um, and as both of you have now been a part of our community for a few months now, um, what Luther Seminary as an institution needs to do moving forward, not only to address the trauma that has been caused in this space um, by members of our community, um, but also as an institution that is raising future church leaders who also need to be able to not only address, but find ways to functionally move forward, um, recognizing the trauma that we have caused. So what do you think that looks like within our community um, and within those of us who are going to be future leaders in the church? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question and a big one. Um, I think any, uh, any institution that wasn't founded as an LGBTQ inclusive institution has a long legacy of violence and trauma that has perpetuated against LGBTQ people, which is pretty much all of our seminaries and churches and denominations. So one of the pieces that I think this institution and any institution with a legacy that extends beyond the point at which they were affirming LGBTQ people is to account, you know, to take account of the ways that we have perpetuated harm against people. And I hear those stories sometimes from people who were students at Luther long before anybody here ever worked at Luther, you know? But that, that's, that's still our institutional narrative. Uh, and so to do that kind of work of repentance, even though most of us here in the institution weren't here when a lot of that happened, we still have to take responsibility for the story that belongs to us and people who were harmed by the institution before most of us even got here. That's hard work. It's, that sounds like the easiest work, to repent for things that you weren't even a part of, but oh gosh, I think that would be really, really difficult and tender pastoral work to do. But if anyone could do it, I think it would be a seminary and hopefully a church. Um, helping queer and trans students know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they belong in this place. That's, I think, the power of telling stories like some of the ones I've told today in this space. Um, I was really looking forward to being in the library. It was just a little smaller than this crowd could fit in, but it was nice to move to the chapel because then we are telling stories in a sacred space that belong in this kind of space. So connecting our current student stories to longer lineages of queer and trans people um, one of the things that Luther does really well, and I, I just name it to say that we should do more of it, 
is, you know, like I'm teaching an LGBTQ kind of oriented pastoral care class. Amy Marga teaches a queer theology class. Um, Amy, uh, Anna Marsh is teaching a sex gender in the Bible class. When I went to seminary, there was no class to talk, to talk about this. If we talked about it, it was because I brought it up in class, you know? Um, so to build into the curriculum, as we have done and I think should continue to do, the ways in which queer and trans lives are part of the Christian narrative, and like Matulski said in that sermon in 1989, God does God's work in the world through people like you. Queer and trans people need to hear that message. Um, all of those things are also the things that I would hope any of you who are preparing for ministry in churches would be learning to do in your churches. Um, a few of you might be called to some churches where that work is already being done, but likely most of you are going to be going into churches where you will be bringing that work in some really beautiful ways, in some ways that are probably really difficult, um, but that will literally, in this case, literally be life-sustaining, and in some cases, life-saving work for people in your communities. I could probably write a 12-page thing, too, like David, but... Uh, those are the things that come to mind right now about the work of a community that is called together around the gospel of peace and justice and healing and reconciliation and repentance and, and life. I think we are at time. I'm not sure if I don't know what the next. I think we have. Say thank you to all, and thank you. Yes, to sure. Cody and Isaac. And there's a little reception outside if you want to join. Yeah, so I'll come out there and we can chat a little more.